Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Fire Your Firewalls for Better Segmentation. Today's event is brought to you by Illumio and produced by Actual Tech Media. Before we get started, we've got a little bit of housekeeping we first need to cover. My name is David Davis. I'm a partner at Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator on today's event. Uh, we have an expert presenter here. I'll introduce him in just a moment. But first, I want to let you know that we want this to be an educational event as much as possible. So we encourage you to use the questions box in GoToWebinar to ask as many questions as you like. We have experts standing by to answer those questions during the event. So make sure that you use that questions box as much as possible. And we'll be answering those questions throughout the event. And then also, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. So use the questions box and ask all your micro segmentation firewall questions and we'll do our best to answer uh second we want you to know we're going to have a uh, amazon 300 gift card drawing at the end of today's event uh, for one lucky attendee on the live uh a live webinar if you're watching this event on demand i'm sorry the drawing has already occurred full price terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com and without further delay, I'm excited to introduce today's expert presenter. That is Mr. Dan Gould, Product Marketing Manager at Illumio. Dan, thanks for being on the event today. You bet, David. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Excellent, excellent. We've been talking a little bit before the event, and I've looked at your presentation. We've got some really great content lined up. Uh, and I know this is a really innovative topic uh, for me and, and for a lot of uh, network experts and security experts out there. So I think this is going to be a great event. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Dan. Great. I'm actually going to go ahead and share my screen, if you don't mind. Let me grab control of the balls. Here we go. All right. I, I do see your screen. And I mean, while you're bringing that up, I want to first ask you, I mean, if we take a step back, you know, for just a moment, I mean, people have been using firewalls forever. They might be relatively new to the idea of segmentation. So, you know, let's start with the why. Uh, why, you know, are people yeah. interested in segmentation? And what is segmentation in a nutshell? Good, good, really good question. And, and I'm glad you asked that. It makes sense to really start from the, the beginning. And, and yeah, why do we segment? Well, you know, we see attackers more and more, David, uh, merely log in, right, to our environments. And that's because they see, Great effectiveness in phishing campaigns, malicious attachments, malicious URLs, right, that lead to stolen credentials, right? So that means bad actors, attackers can merely log in versus, say, hacking in, right? Um, other attacks we've seen, like software supply chain attacks, perhaps uh, the NotPetya or NetNya attack from a couple of years ago, right? That exploited trust, if we recall, between a, uh, a software vendor and its customers, right? So firms doing business with Ukraine downloaded this uh this uh, tax software that was infected, right? And that allowed attackers to move laterally. And we saw the, the great impact it had on uh, companies around the world. Um, you know, ransomware attacks, Baltimore, Atlanta, et cetera, right? There are real reasons to segment, right? To ensure single small security events, David, don't become, say, enormous breaches, right? So that's sort of the why we do it. And you asked about really what, what is segmentation. And we sort of look at it this way. We consider it to be sort of akin to the compartments in a submarine, right? They, they divide the vessel into multiple compartments or, or segments, if you will, right? So a breach in one compartment doesn't sink the whole sub. And with you know, segmentation or security segmentation, we do something very similar in our environments both the cloud and data center. We create you know, fine-grained or hopefully fine-grained segmentation. As I just said, I think that, that prevents small security events from becoming really big ones, right? Because threats are contained by segmentation, right? So that's generally how we think of, of segmentation. Okay, I like that. I like that explanation, especially the security compartmentalization. You know, we think of that if, if the sub has a, a leak in it, we don't want the whole sub to sink. And that's, it's the same way with your network. You don't want the whole network to go down just because there's a single breach uh, exactly. of, of the security. Right, and this is the, the expression we always hear is lateral movement, right? Like they're able to compromise one host, one workload, and then they move laterally, right? They go to where valuable data resides, or, or God forbid, ransomware locks up your you know entire environments. But that's why we segment, right? To contain or compartmentalize threats. 
So, oh, cool. well, let's go. Oh, sorry, David, go ahead. So, when we talk about, you know, segmenting, we, a lot of people think about firewalls. And so, I mean, let's move on. Let's talk about yeah. firewalls. And when people think about firewalls, they think about these massive, expensive, you know, perimeter, mm -hmm. large data center firewalls. It's Tell us about that. words out of my mouth. That that's true. And and yeah, that that is the case. And when you think about segmentation today and how we do it, firewalls do indeed tend to be the status quo. And you know, dare I say, and I know even the the webinar title is somewhat provocative, right? And firing your firewall, but it is the devil we know. Um, it's technology, at least, you know, that was initially commercialized in what the mid nineties, right? Firewall one. So it's technology that's going on some 25 years, 25 years, right? IT looks dramatically different threats, as we just said, look very, very different, right? It's night and day versus where we were 20, 25 years ago, yet we're still using, right? The same 1990s technology to segment our environments internally, right, to make them more resilient to compromise. Um, now, we think about the firewalls, and I think this might have come up, David, when we were, we were chatting previously, but, you know, you asked about perimeter firewalls, right? Yeah, I don't know if you remember that. And there's an important nuance we want to make here. When we think about or say fire your firewall for better segmentation, what we're not talking about is the perimeter edge firewall. Right, and that still plays a hugely, hugely important role, right, at the network edge, separating our trusted internal environments from the untrusted outside world, right? And we've seen all of the progress the NGFW's made over the past, you know, 10, 12 years, right? It's the staple firewall, of course. We've got malware protection, sandboxing, right? Your snort engine, you know, DPAC inspection, IPS, URL filtering, all sorts of threat centric capabilities that the perimeter firewall possesses, right? It's very, very important. So we're not talking about, David, the perimeter firewall. What we are talking about here, when you think about firewalls today, is large data center firewalls, you see on the slide here, for internal segmentation, right? And we really think about um, some of the innovation that's, that's come to fruition for segmentation. And that being the case, this, you know, I think brings us to a point where we really can meaningfully say that we can fire the firewall or at least retire it or repurpose it uh, from segmentation duties, right? Given the, the challenges and the shortcomings uh, that they, they present. And we'll, we'll cover those in a second. Um, now, another aspect we see on the slide here, um, in some cases, we still do see uh, people using the network or network devices to, to segment, right? Creating subnets and VLANs, right? To, to restrict... Uh, communications between between hosts. Now, you know whether you use a big firewall or even the network. More often than not, this can amount to very sort of rough, coarse grained, coarse segmentation. Um, if you do have a subnet, say, and it allows all the sort of IPs, all the hosts inside it to communicate, that may not necessarily be what you want, right? Where there's sort of free communication between all the hosts, right? That doesn't necessarily add up to say a great security that really limits the attack surface to the extent we'd like, right? But, you know, by and large, these big data center firewalls you asked about, these are indeed uh, how we see people doing segmentation today. Um, and, you know, that being the case, we do talk to a lot of organizations, right? And there's a, a reason really why we've spent a lot of time thinking about doing segmentation differently. And candidly, like, it can be very difficult to achieve a really effective security posture that really limits the attack surface with the, the firewall status quo. Um, and I just said, you know, we talked to a lot of organizations and some common pain points and headaches emerge. And they're, they're reflected on this, this slide here, right? And we see on the left, the, the notion of lengthy deployments or time to deploy, time to value. And thinking about firewalls or appliances, far too often, this is still measured in quarters. David, to get you know a, a big firewall deployed, tuned, up and running with the right ACLs and rule sets, right? And we think about why that is. Well, and I don't think this will catch anybody on the call by surprise. Um, you know, I, sp I suppose the, the expression forklift upgrade is not an exaggeration, right? A large data center firewall chassis oftentimes will start on the loading dock, right? It's, it's, it's a big appliance, right? And, and you have to, you know, roll it in, you need a dolly, then you need to get to the racking and stacking, right? Like all the actual physical deployment, that takes some time, right? Also other things that contribute to lengthy deployments, right? You think about uh, 
segmentation design and, and design reviews, right? You want to inventory your systems, understand, you know, what you're trying to protect. You need to, to design your segments, right? This all takes a while. Um, change control processes, right? You want to account for new applications or, or application updates that, that require us to adjust or change firewall rules, right? As this, this new application or, or application behavior traverses network segments, right? That takes a while. And you know we see driver or DevOps in the in the driver seat, um, oftentimes these days. So these updates come fast and furiously, right? They happen all the time, and you know for these reasons, along with others, firewalls take a long time to to deploy and to get in place protecting us. Um, so we'll think about also complexity, right? And you know we would almost submit when we deal with so many IP addresses that we're being undermined by complexity. Um, you know, I, I think most everybody's accustomed to working with IP addresses. That's the way networking has always worked. It's always operated this way. If we reflect soberly, if we will, on them, we realize that, that they are complicated. We don't necessarily communicate in them or think in them. Um, I guess nightmares like don't count. Um, and, and by themselves, they don't give real context about the host, right? I mean, there's a reason why we use domain names. We don't use IP addresses, right? It's just easier and simpler. Um, and you know, I should note, somebody's probably thinking, I've got my you know, subnets committed to memory, and you probably do, but you know, there is no real context just working off of IP addresses, right? And if you, to, to, to use them for segmentation, oftentimes that amounts to re-architecting, readdressing, Right with IP addresses, that's not always possible. Um, it can be really complicated. Sometimes you have to group things together you don't want to, or the other way around, you have to cut corners. You know, and given this complexity, we almost have to wonder why simplicity, at least until now, um, hasn't been brought to bear. Um, and sort of, you know, we think about the complexity of IP addresses, and then the notion of of more David being more. The point of segmentation, obviously, and you know, we, we already said this, is to, to protect valuable assets and data, right, from lateral movement, from insiders, et cetera. And in most conversations we have with customers, there tends to be a, a natural inclination to protect more by moving towards more finer grain segmentation, right? And when you do that, this, this finer grain segmentation on, on firewalls, it quickly becomes a lot, if not too much, to stay on top of. Um, that means, uh, you know, you'll easily have thousands of firewall rules, uh, tens of thousands. And <laughs> I think the largest organization we spoke to in terms of firewall rules, David, get this, they had half a million IP addresses, half a million ACLs. <laughs> I can't believe that. If you run a, a command to show the ACLs and, and sit there and watch them scroll by for Dude, probably... Half a million, right? And so at some point we just have to say, you know what? with respect to complexity, enough's enough, right? And so this complexity is a real challenge we see. Um, that being the case, we can move on to, to cost and expense. And I'm probably not gonna shock anybody, David, when I say that large data center firewalls are very easily six-figure purchases, right? The, 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 the total cost of, of operating a firewall is very considerable, right? It's a almost punitive annual tax burden, if you will. Um, and so there's this initial sticker shock, right? And we think about how we end up doing segmentation with the firewalls, right? They're different segments, different locations, redundancy, David, high availability, right? And so you take this six figure purchase, couple that with the fact that we tend to buy firewalls in pairs, right? And you start effectively doing multiplication, right? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and you're very quickly into the millions of dollars. And I actually was talking to one of our SEs the other day and asked him, like, hey, you know, give me a sort of recent, you know, firewall cost checking you got from an organization, a customer. And he said, all right, recent organization, they were looking to protect 100 servers across, to, uh, across two data centers. And the quote came back four firewalls for a million and a half dollars. There's got to be a better way. We... <laughs> We've been thinking about this a lot. We certainly think so, but look, I, I, you know, there's real cost here, right? And that, David, we're just talking about this sort of the capex for for the big chassis to arrive in your loading dock, right? And you know, I said before that the more is more, right? And God forbid your company grows, 
right? And you've got more applications, more employees, that amounts to you know, more traffic, greater throughput needs, right? So that generally means you have to buy a larger, more expensive box, more throughput. You'll probably have greater segmentation needs, so that amounts to more rules and rule sets. And more often than not, you have to hire new people, right? Fully loaded employees who aren't free either, right? Contributing to ongoing OPEX. So when you take the CapEx, when you take the op OPEX, you know, you, you, you crunch the numbers, many customers, and hopefully, you know, those of you, you know, gang who are listening, you're not in this ballpark, but many of our customers, they've seen total uh, TCO for firewalls in the tens of millions over three years, right? Tens of millions of dollars, that's real money, right? So cost is a consideration. And then we see what we're talking about here on the right, the risky, the unresponsive. And we've almost, we've almost joked at the office that, you know, it's a DevOps world these days and the rest of us are just living in it. And it's not totally the case, obviously, but in many cases, DevOps can be in the driver's seat. And we see this notion of like continuous application development or the, um, the CI, CD, and I'm putting sort of, you know, air quotes, pipeline, right, is coming to the force, right? So, so application updates are coming fast, code changes are very frequent. And this being the case, at least with, with respect to segmentation, we have to wonder like aloud, is the 1990s firewall the most business ready option for 2019, right? And this goes back to that, that change uh, request we were talking about before, accommodating a new application, new application updates, and it takes a long time and it can be really risky, right? Like there's there's the whole process which which may involve you know various teams coming together, you know, finding agreement and making sure naturally that all the ACLs are accommodated, right? Or, or updated. So as a new application is rolled out and it has to tra traverse multiple segments, you don't accidentally break the application, right? That that's generally bad, right? Um, and this often takes this whole process weeks, if not months. Right, and if it does take weeks and weeks to get this in place, you know, it's just not terribly responsive to business needs, right? And we think about the risk piece, and this comes up quite a bit, there has been, at least in conversations we have, a fair amount of frustration that there's no real ability to truly test firewall rules before you push them live. And there's real risk there, right? And I, I think I just said this, the firewall inadvertently breaking an application. And, Oftentimes when we speak to organizations, you know, the general scenario, they'll plan these updates for say a Sunday, they push it live and they effectively cross their fingers or, or pray that when they come into work Monday morning, the network, the application, application works like it should when they're open for business, right? And a misconfig doesn't land them in the doghouse, right? Or they've sort of referred to this as permit and pray, right? So there are some real shortcomings. Um, to using firewalls today for, for segmentations, for segmentation. So that being the case, I've probably beat up on the firewall enough. Let's talk about what the future looks like, the way we're thinking about this, right? Like, how do we think about segmentation moving forward? And we certainly think that it does require us to think a bit differently, right? And oftentimes when we're having these conversations, we tend to frame it with a real world challenge or problem we, we've solved. Uh, in, a way, uh, in a way we've thought differently in our day-to-day -day lives. And an example, as you can see on the slide, is, is on the road. And, you know, not long ago, um, wherever you had to pay a toll, you had to stop and do it, right? You had to physically stop, uh, you know, hand a five, ten dollar bill to someone in a toll booth, right? They give you your change, right? And meanwhile, what's happening, right? There's a backup of cars behind you, sometimes stretching for miles, um, to everybody's great frustration. Right, and so what have we done now? Though we've we've effectively separated, decoupled this this toll collection from the physical toll booth. Right, we've made this electronic. We made toll collection electronic. So you've got a transponder in your car, and you merely drive through, and the toll is automatically taken care of. So you've got better traffic throughputs, right? Less waiting, uh, happier drivers, thanks to this process of like separating or decoupling, right? So this is sort of a real world example we often sort of set the stage with, right? And we use this as a backdrop that, that's somewhat analogous to how we're thinking about segmentation now. And you can see here on the left, we, we think about segmentation as something we need to separate or, or decouple from the network, from the firewall. 
And candidly, and we probably you're on this webinar because you already realize we feel this way, the firewall is the wrong tool for the job if the job is segmentation. We think about security's job, the firewall's job, it's to, to isolate, to block, right? And then on the other hand, we have the network. It's meant to connect, right? To get packets from A to B as quickly as possible. Those are effectively two opposing forces and we bring them together in the data center. And that can be a recipe for disaster, right? And for this reason, it really, at least in our perspective, makes a lot of sense to decouple segmentation from the network. And, you know, generally, and we'll talk more about this, how do we do this? Well, we call on a whitelist model that utilizes the firewalling capabilities that already exist on host OSs, right, to deliver segmentation. And if we remember, uh, Linux has IP tables, Windows has Windows filtering platform, right? So those are the controls that already exist uh, and we take advantage of those. So let's look a bit more specifically, what does that amount to, right? And so we start by putting a very lightweight antenna, if you will, or agent, whatever you wanna call it, on hosts, on workloads, right? And those can be bare metal servers, virtual machines, you know, containers, you know, public cloud, you name it. And that tiny antenna, if you will, has two simple jobs, just two. It collects telemetry and sends telemetry back, and it also takes instruction, right? It doesn't do deep packet inspection. It doesn't uh, take packets out of the kernel. It do just does those two things, right? And we initially, David, we collect telemetry, right, from the workload. So right? we'll understand the operating systems, the interface, IP addresses, processes running. Um, oh, the IP addresses that host is talking to, of course. And we use that to build a map of what's happening application-wise. Right, you get a, a live application map of the communications or the connectivity between workloads. And this can be across your entire environment, both you know, on-prem data center and the cloud. Right? And we really feel that this is a vital, important first step because you really understand your traffic flows, your applications, right? And the processes that 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 comprise them. Right. So I mean, just to summarize, you know exactly what's happening application-wise you know exactly what the application is doing and what it needs to do, or perhaps, you know, I should say what it should be, excuse me, what it should be allowed to do to get its job done, right? So you've got this application. And uh, Dan, I'm sorry to, I don't want to inter interrupt you. You're on a roll here, you're, you're going so great. Um, but I want to make sure that I understand and that the audience sure. understands. So with Illumio, we don't have to install a bunch of hardware. It's just software, is that right? That's, that, that's right, and that's a good clarification. Again, this is a very, very lightweight agent or antenna, if you will. Okay. We, we like it to antenna. In fact, that's one of our customers uh, described it that way. And by doing so, correct, we do not have to install any hardware. Okay. Because and again, we're effectively decoupling from the network, right? So we're, we're, we no longer have to rely on hardware. And so this agent or antenna, it effectively is able to control the host space firewalls that are just already present in just about every operating system out there. That's right. That's exactly right. And, you know, we'll get to that in a minute, but it's, you know, it's got two simple jobs, right? It collects the telemetry and it, it takes instructions back from our central brain. And that's where it can really control the native uh, firewalling controls on the host. And I mean, the reason people never use these host space firewalls in the past, I mean, they've, they've been there for forever for the right. most part was, uh, I would say they just didn't, they were afraid the, the host didn't have the horsepower, which uh, they have tons of horsepower now, and um, they weren't able to centrally control them. That's right, exactly. And you all have really manual solved. Task. Exactly. Very nice. And yeah, and so, so then that's right. We've, we've essentially solved for this, but we sort of have this central brain, right, that will collect this telemetry, right, and it, it, it presents you with a map, and then from that map, again, we know exactly what applications need to do to get their jobs done, right? Nothing more, nothing less. And so with that in place, we automatically generate segmentation policies, right? We can say this workload needs to do X, Y, and Z, you know, with these ports and protocols, that's all we will let it do, right? And we tee up a segmentation policy, it's automatic, and you just push it live, right? And so again, there's no ACLs involved here, right, to get segmentation in place. Right, and so it's really powerful. Now, what really I think one of our differentiators is when we think about segmentation, right? We use this map and we use these you know, insights to build these segmentation policies based on human understandable labels, right? Not the IP addresses we talked about before. And you know, I'll show you a screenshot in a second, you'll see this, but 
we really spent actually countless hours thinking about and perfecting these human understandable labels, right? So a web server is labeled as a web server, if you can believe it, right? Not, not an IP address. And with the labels, you'll know what the application is, right? Is it, you know, HRM? Is it asset management? Is it CRM? You'll know exactly what the application is. Uh, it's, it's role or it's function, right? Is it, you know, web? Is it a database? Uh, what stage of the, you know, dev life cycle? Is it you know, production? Is it dev, QA? Um, location, that's vitally important. And location is very flexible. It can be whatever the organization wants it to be. Uh, it can be Denver, it can be Germany, um, you know, it can be rack three, or it can be in the cloud, right? Like data center, AWS East or something, right? Whatever makes sense for the organization, right? So we've got these labels to, to, to really make this a lot easier to understand. So we're really focused on segmentation outcomes and not sort of untangling IP addresses, right? And so that's really, really powerful. And, you know, lastly, of course, we can very easily test our policies against existing traffic flows without enforcement. So you can see what will happen, any deviations, any issues prior to pushing anything live or breaking anything, right? So it's very easy to test. And then if naturally you, you push it live. And this goes back to David, what you were just saying of you know being able to program the native controls firewalling controls right on a host our central brain if you will right sends the segmentation policy we've built and it pushes it out to the little agent or antenna right and there we go it programs the native host-based stateful firewalls on every workload right and that's that that is a far more powerful far simpler way to get to um security segmentation and to me this is how it should have been just to begin with. But um, back to the labels, just for a second, sure. where do the labels come from? Do I have to sit ah. there and label all my traffic with the label maker or how does that work? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. And I probably should have, should have acknowledged this. So it's not a manual process. Like that would be, that would be awful, right? Um, generally speaking, many of our customers have their CMDB and we will basically connect to that and pull the labels in. Right now, it can basically be any system of record they've got. It can be vManage, it can be a spreadsheet, but we will basically ingest these labels from any source an organization would like. It's not a manual process. So, so thank you for asking that. I like it. What's it look like? Let's see some yes. screenshots here. So I think, yeah, I, I gave people a, a little teaser. So, you know, we're accustomed to, to the, the five tuple view, if you will, of ACLs and segmentation, but this, is what segmentation looks like when we effectively decouple from the, the firewall and we're using these native controls, right? And business friendly labels, right? And so we can see here, right? And actually uh, included this view because you can see the policy, right? The scope, um, any workload in the asset management application that's in production in California can talk to each other, right? This is basically a straightforward application ring fence. Now, I should note it's very, very easy to get far more granular here right, where you can bring this down to the, the, the protocol or process level, right? And so it's very easy to become as granular as you want, right, with segmentation. It's something that just wasn't easy to do before without adding, you know, dozens of, of new rules, right? So also to note here, just you see the green lines between the workloads, that means there, there, are, there are segmentation policies in place, right? So they're, they're, they can be considered secure, right? This is a new way to look at segmentation. Right, that really, I think, bring, makes it far more simple and far more powerful, we think, to getting very powerful segmentation in place. Now, I want to revisit something else. We talked about change uh, requests, right, that come through. And they happen often, and it's not always a simple process to accommodate them, right? So how do we keep pace? Well, the answer is a lot faster than before, honestly, right? And there are a couple of ways to, to, to do this, right? If a new application is coming on board or an application update. If you really, you understand the behaviors, you can write the policy yourself and push it live. Done, right? Uh, and you can either put that into enforcement or really have alerts fire on deviations, just alerts where you're not blocking, if you will. Or something else that's really easy is that you can let the application run to quickly understand its behaviors and then we'll automatically tee up a policy for you that you can push live in a click, right? You test it and push it live. Like it's very, very simple to keep pace with business now with this newer approach. All right, so spoken a lot about, you know, why, but let's look at some of the, the benefits. And these are really tend to be taken from a lot of the, the customer conversations and case studies we have. 
um, when we look to really quantify some of the benefits of, of you know, this new way of thinking about security segmentation. And we see the fast here on, on the left, and this gets at what we're talking about before, the time to value, the, the time to deploy. And we've protected environments with hundreds of workloads in less than two months. All right, and that's zero to fully protected in less than two months. All right, and you contrast that with the quarters it takes to get firewalls up and running. And granted, mileage may vary. Certain teams might be super efficient with getting firewalls up and running, so maybe it doesn't take them quite so long, but oftentimes it does take six months, nine months longer to get you know, firewalls fully up and running, fully deployed. Um, I also pinged our, our professional services team the other day just to ask and said, hey, you know what? What's a recent deployment look like? And they said, we were able to protect some 6,000 workloads, not insignificant, at an insurer in less than two months. 6,000 in less than two months, and that's from zero to fully deployed with all the policies in place, right? So we can really get up and running five, four, five, six times faster. That's not at all uncommon. Now we think about the simplicity, right? We bring to the IP addresses we've been talking about. And, you know, a couple of examples, we've seen customers segment, and this is actually, David, I have to say, like, we were astounded. We Even we had a hard time believing this. Um, one of our customers segmented thousands of workloads across a couple of data centers with 40 Illumio policies that replaced 15,000 firewall rules. That's a lot of firewall uh, rules. It is. 40 policies. We had to double check, like, are you sure this is, yeah? 40 Illumio policies instead of 15,000 firewall rules, right? That's very, very powerful, the simplicity, right? Um, there's an organization, uh, a large banking institution we've all heard of that reduced their firewall rules by 90%, right? And that's where the number on the slide comes from, 90% with us. That's not bad, right? These are real examples of, of making segmentation, making life dramatically simpler, right? For with more business-based, human understandable rules that are decoupled from the network, right? And I would say that other organizations who move forward with Illumio can expect simplification along these lines. Um, and then the cost, we talked about this before, right? The big data center firewall that's in the six figures. Um, I think, you know, moving beyond firewalls for segmentation can easily bring 100, 200% or more in cost savings. Um, there's a big SaaS company that does use us, and let me check my notes here, I wanna make sure I get this right. Um, they put Illumio in place to, uh, to basically spend less or stop spending on, on segmentation firewalls and they saved $10 million. Now, they're a relatively large deployment, right? So 10 million is a lot. So, you know, many organizations won't be quite in that ballpark, but they will be in the 200% or more, if not 500% less expensive, right? And, you know, on this note, and we'll share this, um, David, in a second, we created actually a TCO calculator. And it really helps compare the cost of firewalls versus Illumio. And, you know, I want to note that, you know, you'll see this in a second for yourself. It just asks for you to plug in three simple values. And we did program some of the, the values in the calculator with numbers from NSS Labs. David, we did not pull these out of the sky or inflate them to make us look good. We use numbers from a third party. And, you know, one example we'll share, and we encourage you to, to, to take this first spin yourselves to see really where you come out. But an example from the calculator I, I pulled here, protecting a thousand workloads, uh, the TCO savings with us over a few years would be north of, um, you know, million eight hundred thousand, right? And you'll, you'll see this in the, 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 the calculator itself. Does it seem too good to be true? Maybe, maybe not. You should see for yourself, right? But we have driven tremendous cost savings when people have moved to a new way of security segmentation, right? And something that's actually, you know, before I move on, something I want to note, we also allow you to enforce only on servers you wanna protect or only on workloads you want to protect. So that makes segmentation more effective. You may be very clear on the workloads that matter, the ones you wanna protect, and you can only protect those, right? So that can also make it even more cost-effective. And, you know, the 100% the, the confidence on, on the right here. Now we discussed earlier the lack of ability to always test firewall rules prior to, to pushing them live and the risk associated with that. Um, and you know, you break the application in inverted man Monday morning, awful, right? Um, and this is really related to the fact that with us, it's foundational, the ability to, to see and test a policy prior to pushing it into enforcement, right? So ultimately, meaning you'll have total 100% confidence in segmentation doing its job. Right? So these are some of the benefits of segmentation 
These are real world. These are pulled from actual companies using Illumio. Now, you know, it's important to note that, that a lot of big companies with plenty at stake have done this, have moved forward with Illumio, right? They've decoupled segmentation from their firewalls to great success. Um, you know, you see these logos, they've got, they've got a lot at stake in terms of being big targets for attack and a lot of sensitive data to, to protect. So there are a lot of big organizations who've made this shift because they find it compelling. So Dan, with these all these big companies using yeah. Illumio, I mean, don't they just have the money to buy and just test one of everything? Or why, why is it that they're sticking uh, with Illumio? Uh, that, okay, that, that's a fair question. And yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good question. And I would be willing to, to bet, David, that, that most vendors come in, right? And probably, you know, people on the call speak to a lot of vendors who bring up this. Uh, I've heard this type of slide for, referred to as the NASCAR slide, right, with all the logos. Um, and many of the organizations on those slides tend to be big ones you've heard of, right? Great. But let me note that with these organizations, yeah, indeed, we don't dispute the fact that really big companies with deep pockets can probably find money to test anything that seems, you know, remotely interesting. But let me say this about Illumio. They've tested us and they've put us into enforcement mode to protect what matters to their organization. David, so not only did they test us out, but they realized this is a better way to do things. So we are not shelfware at these organizations, David. Let me be clear about that. They were protecting what truly matters to them with Illumio. So that's a fair question, but you know, rest assured these organizations rely on us. All right. Well, you know, I guess as the the cliche goes, you know, don't just take our word for it. Um, you know, these are taken, as you can see, direct quotes from Gartner Peer Insights. Now I won't read them aloud, but you see organizations are sharing their feedback. They're getting tremendous segmentation value, right? Network security and simplifying the firewall management, right? And if you check out this link or go to Gartner Peer Insights, check out what people are saying about Illumio, right? Don't just take our word for it. See what your peers are, or are, are the value they're getting from Illumio, right? And I think this Peer Insights is a good resource to do that. Now, all right, a couple of next steps and we'll sort of wrap things up here. I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, the TCO calculator. And I think we're gonna drop this into the, uh, the chat so you can all access this. Um, take this for a spin yourselves. It just asks for three simple values. You'll be able to see the other values we programmed in to understand the ROI with Illumio, right? This is very powerful and it's very important, all right? So please take this for a spin. And speaking of taking uh, things for a spin, we'd love for you to get your hands dirty, right? To really you know, get to know Illumio firsthand. There are a few ways to do that, right? So if you'd like to take a guided tour, sort of a cultivated walk um, around the product, please do that, right, with our guided tour. We also give you access, if you'd like, to our free trial, which is access to our SaaS offering, right? So you can deploy this and really see the value of Illumio, right? Get that application visibility, understand how powerful our business label-driven policies are for segmentation, right? Or if you'd like, we can work with you. We can come to you with a custom demo um, that's, that's highly tailored to your environment to really see the value we bring to segmentation in your particular environment. So um, let's stop it there, David. I, I think, you know, I, I really encourage people, have a look. Many of the benefits, again, we've taken these from our customers. We've not made these up. So you can expect some similar, some similar value, similar benefits. Um, and I really want to thank everybody for for uh, joining us today. Yeah, awesome, awesome presentation, Dan. And I mean, it, as you talk about all the different statistics, you know, the the tremendous amount of um, budget that can be saved uh, on your firewall investment, the, the efficiency that can be gained, you know, to free yourself of all these, you know, firewall upgrades and and implementations, and just the ability to make the life of you know network and security and uh, IT managers easier. Um, Illumio strikes me as a product that just uh, once people hear about it, it, it their their eyes are opened, <laughs> they see the light, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, why didn't we do this before? Wow, this is the right. We should have been doing this all along," kind of thing. Yeah, yeah so, totally. Um, you know, once they see our Illumi our illumination view of their network, their eyes are really going to be opened, right? They're, they they it's very powerful. I did that actually at a trade show. There was a giant screen in the Illumio booth, and I got illumin illuminated. 
<laughs> uh, and I was able to see the the visibility of the network, you know, all the traffic that was flowing between all the different nodes and saw how easy it was to block traffic or, you know, secure the network. So, yeah. Um, all right, with that said, let's go to some Q&A from the audience. We've been getting a lot of great questions coming in. We've been answering some of them uh, during the event. Um, let's see, one of the questions that popped up here they're asking about is, um, what's the time frame to, to train my staff, in your opinion, from the time that we say go, okay, we want to implement Illumio, how much training, what, are the, what would they go through? Good, good question. That's a fair question, because this, this is new, right? Like, we're accustomed to, like, apples, right? Um, so a couple of things. It's really important that our professional services team is there every step of the way, right? And we really hold your hand throughout the whole training process. And we'll have some deep dives that last, you know, three or four days. Um, and so I would say, you know, initially it's probably, you know, a few days of, of, of training. And then from there on out, we're with you from there on out every step of the way to make sure your policies look right, you're comfortable with the product. But, you know, I'd say initially some training is probably, you know, three, four days. Okay. Okay. Very nice. Sounds easy. Much, much uh, easier than going to a, a firewall administration class and flying uh, across the country to do it. Uh, um, all right. Another question here. Uh, can malicious attackers just modify the host firewalls, you know, without uh, Illumio's knowledge? Right, right, right. That, okay. Interesting question. This does come up quite a bit. The answer in a nutshell is no. We've got multiple checks in place to ensure this doesn't happen, right? Like say, for example, somebody tries to you know, fiddle with or wipe IP tables, we automatically restore them. Uh, if they try to kill the agent and wipe IP tables, we restore both of those things, right? So we've got multiple checks that ensure this doesn't happen. Now, you know, we talked, uh, you know, I think we started by talking about attackers, right? And we never want to underestimate the will of a really motivated attacker. Now, we've never actually seen this occur. I should know, right? This never happens. However, however, um, if say for example, and again, this is just, you know, for the sake of conversation, somebody was able to assume control of a machine, David, um, and they've been able to wipe IP tables, you know, disable the agent, et cetera. What happens then, right? Well, we've accounted for that too. So basically what happens is that, that host or that workload machine stops checking in with our central brain, right? And so we realize that, you know, hey, something's up with this, with this workload. This is bad. This is wrong. This shouldn't be happening. So we effectively uh, implement host isolation, right? So we will not accept connections from the compromised workload, right? So it's basically isolated uh, and it can't, can't spread. They can't move anywhere or can't move laterally, right? So really good question that comes up all the time, right? Do people try to disable IP tables or the agent? Okay. Okay, cool. I'm glad that you all have already thought of that. You have a solution ready to go if that ever did potentially happen. Another question here, uh, does this work for uh, containers? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Okay. Container orchestration, containers, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, go to our website, you'll see, you know, quite a bit of, of, of thought on containers. We actually um, began thinking about and protecting containers in 2015. Right, so it's been many years of thinking about how to 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 protect containers. Okay, and what about virtualization hypervisors? Yep, absolutely. Like you know, you name it. Like we will work with the flavor of your choice. Um, you know, that, that's absolutely the flexibility is built in, so you can use any hypervisor that uh, you know you feel comfortable with. Okay, and it works on Windows as well as Linux. Yes, yeah, of course, indeed. Okay, and what about the network gear? Is does it have to be compatible somehow with? No, no, no. With yeah. So, you know, the, the fact is, as we said, we're decoupled from the network. So we are largely in more, we're indifferent to what's sort of happening on the network right beside us. So, so yeah, there, there's no concerns about networking gear. Okay. Uh, another question came in, they're asking, should I focus segmentation just on specific systems or do you, do you see it deployed across the entire network? You know, that, that varies by organization, right? And I think okay. they'll probably start with, you know, they have a sense for where the, the most sensitive sort of crown jewels reside. They'll tend to start there, right? And so typically it's probably data sensitivity is what drives the rollout of, of Illumio. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Another question, um, will this help with PCI compliance? It will, indeed. We've got a ton of information, I should say, on our website about PCI. But yes, when you think about some of the segmentation controls that PCI calls for, absolutely it will. Um, I encourage people, if they've got PCI questions, go to the website. We've got 
um, a lot of information, calculators, guides, et cetera, on PCI. Okay, nice. Another question here, uh, what's the pricing model for Illumio? So we're priced by workload, right? And so I mentioned this before that you can be very selective about what you'd like to protect, thus keeping cost in check, right? And so um, we're priced by workload, so it's very flexible in a sense. Um, and so really it, it, you're not facing those steep data center firewall invoices that uh, maybe we're you know, sadly accustomed to. Yeah, I like that. So you can just select, like you said, the crown jewels, start with that, and then you know, most likely expand over time. But that's very different from buying a, a giant monolithic uh, firewall to, to implement. Indeed. And, and that's generally, I'm glad you said that, it's generally how it works, right? People will start uh, and they'll, they'll have their, their most important assets if it's you know, half their environment, and then they'll see the power, the ease, the simplicity, and then they'll gradually they'll deploy more of our, our little agents uh, throughout their environment. So it tends to be sort of, they tend to you know, land and expand as the expression goes. Nice, nice, okay. Um, and then I want to ask you, you know, I, I posted the test drive link there in the chat for everyone to check out, uh, both the firewall TCO calculator as well as the test drive. So make sure you, that you click on those, open them up in your web browser. Um, but so, so Dan, say that I go through the test drive, uh, I sign up, uh, are there requirements I need to know about? Can I test it non-disruptively? How does that work? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so this is, again, this is our SaaS product and you will be in test mode, right? So you'll get full visibility. You'll see all the communications between your hosts and you'll understand the policies and what they can do, what they can protect and segment. You won't be in enforcement mode. So it will be totally, you know, there will be no disruption to, uh, to your environment. So I would, yeah, definitely encourage people to use the free trial because there's really nothing at stake except for getting a better understanding of how you can do segmentation. I like that, and it's, it's just software, so it's easy to, to deploy, easy to test. Yeah. And this is, again, this is our SaaS version, so we uh, there's nothing to deploy either. Oh, okay, even better. <laughs> all right. Well, Dan, I think we've answered most all the questions out there that we have time for. Uh, it's been a fast-paced, uh, really good event. We got a lot of feedback, a nice presentation, great webinar, things like that in the comments. So thank you so much for being on the event today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And thank you to Illumio for supporting today's event. And thank you to everyone out there in the audience for joining us on today's event. We know you're very busy in the world of IT. So thanks for taking out uh, some time to learn about microsegmentation. For more information, make sure you check out that test drive URL that I put in the chat. Just click on the link and you can sign up for the test drive and give Illumio a spin for yourself and see what it can do for you, how it can help you uh, save money and make your company more efficient, more agile, and most importantly, even more secure. Hope you enjoyed the webinar. Have a great day.